Please open to Romans 10. Romans 10. This is going to kind of be like a connection point of where we are, where we were last week. You know, last week in Ephesians, Paul talked about um, his specific calling. In fact, if you look at Acts 9, and he's going to persecute the church, and then God intervenes along the way and calls him out of persecuting the kingdom and leads him into proclaiming the kingdom. And uh, we've been talking just as leadership within the church, the importance of actually, I know that you have one of these at your house. I know that you have one of these at the place where you live. In fact, I bet you that most of you have more than five of these. And you might be like, well, I can, I can look at my Bible on my phone or on my iPad. But how many of you are easily distracted? Come on now. How many of you are easily distracted? God has given us his word. And his word is life. His word is truth. His word is hope. And it's the story of God. Romans 10 um, actually starting at verse 14 down to 17. Romans 10, 14, 17. Romans 10, 9 and 10 are, is what I said earlier. That's awesome. But, but Mitch is going, he came into a church um, in Guatemala, preached a sermon for us tonight. It's 20 minutes long for those of you that look at your clock, but it's really good. And I just want to set it up with this passage of scripture that he's going to be focused in on. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed that he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Did you catch that last part? Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. People need to hear the word. And those of us that preach every week, we're not going to do it perfectly. Uh, I know that there are many things that I have, I have prepared and poured over and prayed over and presented. And, and it's been laid out there. And then I go back and watch and listen. And I'm like, oh, I can't believe I said that one line or that one phrase. Oh, how do I take that back. And yet God works in powerful ways around the world. There are people that literally in different tribes around the world might only have one verse that they have access to that someone has told them and they're more faithful in their Christian witness than many of us Americans within the church. May we be spurred on by people like Mitch who's going to bring uh, the message to us tonight. May we be spurred on by people who set aside so many things of this life so the people can hear the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is my friend, Mitch, down in Guatemala. I, I pastor in a, a rural area. It's called Los Chalitos. It's in the middle of nowhere, Guatemala. Um, and if you're kind of looking at the screen and, and looking around, like you can tell, like I'm definitely not there. Uh, and so I'm at uh, Casa de Libertad. It's Acts 29 church, pastored by Francisco Benfelt. He's the uh, director for Latin America with Acts 29. Um, and so if you ever get to come down on, on a mission trip or, or, or anything, uh, definitely come by and visit him. Uh, he's, he's a super cool guy, and he's graciously let me borrow his facilities. Um, if you come to where I'm at, uh, bring lots of bug spray uh, because it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. When I was about 15 years old, uh, I, I went to a Wednesday night service. I was invited to a Wednesday night service at a church in uh, Humble, Texas. And the youth pastor at the time named Stacy Witt uh, shared the gospel. Um, and it wasn't anything emotional for me. It, wasn't, it was just like I was asleep and then I woke up. Like it made sense to me. And so uh, that night I, I gave my life to Christ um, and then, you know, was following Jesus all throughout high school. Uh, and then when I got to college, I went to the University of Arkansas and it was the last semester before I graduated. Man, I was reading through a passage uh, in Matthew. It's the parable of the sheep and the goats. And it's this, um, it's this parable that, that one day, at the end of time, the Son of Man will return. And he'll gather all the nations before his throne. Uh, whether they're children or adults, whether they're rich or, or poor, or whether they're American or Guatemalan or, or whatever it may be. But everyone will be gathered before his throne and will be separated into two camps. Those who know and, and Jesus as their Savior 
and have followed him and, and, and they'll go to be with him forever in heaven. Uh, and then those who don't um, are separated from him forever. And I remember when I was reading this passage, there was just kind of this whisper. It was my own thought in my mind just kind of asking me, like, do you believe this with all who you are? Man, and, and it wrecked me. I mean, it wrecked me. I, I think uh, Chandler puts it another way. He says, at, at, at some point, you're just going to have to wrestle through the scriptures and decide for yourself whether or not God is telling the truth or joking in them. Because the scripture has radical implications for our lives and especially for those who don't know him. And so I'll contend that scripture is true. And so holding to it with, with all who I am, with all my, my, my uh, heart and soul and mind and strength that, that I'm going to try to, to follow it obediently. And so the, the passage that we're going to get into tonight, it's, it's Romans 10. Um, but before we get there, I, I want to go to Romans 9 because I, I really think that um, uh, Timothy Keller says it this way. Although Paul is logical in his writing, he's never cold in his feelings. And so I think in Romans 9, we can really see what pushes Paul and, and what compels him and what drives him um, to share the gospel uh, and see churches planted. And so it starts in, in Romans 9, verse 1, and it says, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying, and my conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, for those of my own race. This is incredible. I mean, this is just an astonishing statement, is it not? I mean, Paul, like, he knows what it is to have a relationship with Christ. Like, he has communion with him. Like, he's aware of the depth of his sin and, and how God has mercif mercifully saved him. And he's been freed of that. And he knows, he's tasted and seen that the Lord is good. He knows that us as believers, that at the end of days, that, that we'll, we'll see Jesus face to face. And that we'll commune with him, that we'll eat with him, that we'll drink with him, that, that, that we'll have this relationship with Jesus. That, that it's, just, it's more than just these, these facts, right? I mean, scriptural, scripture is factual, but, but it, it's nothing less than that. But it's, it's definitely more than that. And so, so Paul knows what it's like to have this relationship with Jesus, to taste it. And then not only that, he's fully aware, fully aware of the consequences or the repercussions of rejecting Jesus as, as a savior. Uh, what we can see in, in Daniel 12, 2, where it says, multitudes of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, and others to shame and everlasting content. And so we know that, that those who, who follow Jesus, that are his disciples, will be with him forever. And then he's aware that, that those who don't, you know, uh, have Christ as their savior are eternally separated. And so he, he's aware of this. And yet in the midst of that, he still says that he wishes that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own brothers. He's saying that if I could somehow like give up what it is to know Jesus, if I could somehow give up my salvation, knowing that that would save unbelieving Israel, then I'll do it. And, and this is a crazy statement, but, but I think we can see his burden and his heart for the lost. I mean, I think he's wrestled through scripture and he, he is fully aware that what is written is true. That he's convinced that what is written will come to fruition. I think John Piper says it this way, that, that oh, if we could just get a heavenly mindset of these things, if, if, we, could, if we could just realize that, that eternity is long, that our lives are vapors, that hell is horrific with pain and heaven is ecstatic with joy, these are the great realities. If we could just have this mindset, if we could just realize that we have this one life to make Jesus known and, and, um, and, then, and then we can't share the gospel in heaven. Um, Amy Carmichael, uh, I believe she was a missionary in uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s, says it this way, that we have all of eternity to talk about the victories won for Christ, but we only have before sunset to make them known. I mean, so like the, the time is, is short um, and, and we have this one chance to make Jesus famous. 
And so I think that, that Paul's just brokenness for the loss is one thing that drives him in, in wanting to see others come to know Jesus as their Savior. And I think the other part is um, Paul's desire for the glory of God to be spread across the earth as the waters covers the seas. And I, th- I think we can see this um, in Psalms 117. Um, obviously, Paul didn't write, write that, but I think we can kind of see this, this desire where it says, Praise the Lord, O you nations. Extol him, all you people, for great is God's love towards us, and his mercy endures forever. I mean, this is what Paul wants. He wants. He has experienced what it's like to be freed from, from the depths of his sin, have communion with God, and, and he wants others to come and experience that and know that. He wants people to come and, and love Jesus like he loves him. And so that's what, 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 what pushes Paul. That, that's is what his convictions are. And ultimately, um, that's what our convictions should be. And coming to Guatemala, that's what my conviction was. Like, I wanted, I ain't come to Guatemala um, thinking about planting a church. I came to Guatemala because I wanted to share the gospel and give everyone an opportunity to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, and and I, you can do that in the States, and, and God has placed people in the, in the States to do that. Uh, in, in my story, uh, I was listening to, to John Piper, and he said something like this. He said, the missionary question is not where are there lost people or where are there unbelievers because there's unbelievers everywhere. He's saying the missionary question is where are there unbelievers without any Christians in them or within them or without a local church strong enough to do the neighboring evangelism that we could do if we just want to do it? That's the missionary question. And so going to our text, it's Romans 10, 14. It says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So going back to verse 14 where it says, how can they call on the name of the one they have not believed in? Now, I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I spent like hours trying to figure out like if there's anything like super deep to this, and, and, and maybe I just missed it, um, which definitely could have happened. But thinking about it, like I, I think it's just really simple. I think the first part of Romans 10, uh, Paul's talking about like w- how it is that we can be saved. And then I think the latter part of Romans 10, Paul is sharing like um, how we can help others be saved. And so it's, it's that simple that, that, um, that the gospel is a message that has to be proclaimed. If you're a believer in Christ, it's because someone has proclaimed the message to you. I mean, I heard it when I was 15, um, and, um, but maybe you've heard it through relatives or um, acquaintances or friends or family, whoever it may, may be. But this message was proclaimed to you, and as a result, you either believed it or, or rejected it. So this is what Paul is saying. He's saying that, that there's all these, these lost people. There's unbelieving Israel, and today there's all these lost people. And how can they call on, on the one they have not believed in unless we go and share it? I mean, th- this is God's um, mission. For, is, it's for the church to go and, and, and make Jesus famous. I mean, I don't know why God chose us as his plan, but that's what he's chosen. And so us as believers, we have the only means of escape. We have the only means of salvation in Jesus Christ. And God has chosen us, the church, to go and make his name known. So one of my points is how, one of my points is we can't be a church planning church. Or we can't be churches that plant churches if we're not evangelistic. I mean, if we don't have, like, this brokenness for the loss, if we don't have, like, this, this love for, to see God's glory expand through the nations, you know, if we're not evangelistic, uh, where we are, whether that's in, in the States or, or overseas, um, then how, how's the church going to grow? We have to go. You know, we have to go. And so um, when Amanda and I uh, first got to Guatemala, we didn't have much of a plan um, other than we wanted to go and share the gospel. And so, I mean, maybe that wasn't like the, the wisest thing, but uh, we felt like there's just too many people um, who don't know Jesus, who are sinking into an eternal darkness. In Proverbs uh, 24, 11, um, rescue those being led away to death, hold back those staggering towards slaughter. So this is our call. 
as a church to go and, and to and to proclaim Jesus to the nations. Um, and it says, how can they preach unless they are sent? And then it says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. <laughs> now, this kind of thing, I mean, like, feet are nasty, man. Like, I haven't seen a beautiful foot in my life. And I was kind of chuckling because um, when I, I had Amanda look over my sermon notes yesterday, and then she wrote kind of in the corner, okay, a little baby foot is cute. And so that kind of threw me off. But, like, I mean, feet are not pretty. I mean, they're just not, man. And, and um, I think the, the main point of this is, is how beautiful. I mean, how beautiful is it when someone brings the good news to, to the marriage that's in shambles and brings hope? I mean, how beautiful is it when uh, those who are in darkness hear the gospel? I mean, this is um, salvation, I mean, saving news. I mean, like, how beautiful is it? How beautiful is it when we can see Jesus for all who he is, when we can be released from the bondage of our sin, when we can um, be passed from um, darkness into the kingdom of light? I mean, how beautiful, really, how beautiful is this news when, when it's proclaimed and people are saved? I mean, how beautiful is it? And, and um, I just want to give us, like, a, a quick example. If, if we go to, to Genesis, and we see in Genesis how God created everything, and everything was good, right? And then Adam and Eve sin, and, and they mess everything up. I mean, just everything gets thrown in, in, in the shambles. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever had anything precious or anything that you, like, deeply cared about. Or um, I mean, when, when I was younger, uh, when I was a little boy, I had, like, this Lego set of mine that I really liked. And when my siblings came in and played with it and broke it, I mean, the anger that filled me and just wanted them to physically harm them for breaking something that was mine. You know, and, and if we can go back, um, you would expect that, that God would come to Adam and Eve and just with this anger, be like, what have you done? Like, do you not realize what you've done, the mess you've made, like what you've created, like what this is going to cost me? But we don't see that. We see a God who says, Adam, where are you? I mean, don't, don't run from me. Don't flee from me. Like, like I can fix this. It's going to be okay. Like, like I'll send my son. Like, it, it might cost me, like, his life. But, like, just don't flee from me. Like, we see a God who, who loves us and, and, and who wants us to be with him. And so I think what Paul is saying is how beautiful is it when this message is proclaimed and when, when people who are on their way to an eternal darkness, hear the gospel and are saved. I mean, how beautiful are these news? It, 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 are these news? And he says, but not, not all the Israelites have accepted the good news. And this is true. I mean, when Amanda and I came down to uh, uh, share the gospel, um, it, took, it took several years for a church to be planted. I mean, we shared the gospel and shared the gospel and shared the gospel. Um, and um, there were several people who, who just didn't accept the message. Like, who just, they don't want to believe. You know, and, and it's going to be true in the States. But just be, but because of that, that doesn't mean that we can't try to push back what's dark in this world, that we can't uh, proclaim that message to others. That we, we have to be faithful. Uh, we have to be, be faithful in going out and, and sharing the message. We have to be faithful in, in seeing um, churches planted, that, that plant churches. I mean, like, we, we, we have to have this evangel, evangelistic heart to see God's church planted. Planted among the unreached, planted in, um, throughout the states, planted wherever it may be. We have to be faithful, knowing that it's not our job to save them. But we can, like Paul, we, we can be broken for them, and we can pray mercy, like, that God would have mercy on them, that God would have mercy on our, on our family, um, on our on, on our relatives, on, on our friends, on, on, who, on, on whoever it may be. Planning churches isn't going to be easy. Sharing the gospel isn't going to be easy. There will be several who won't accept the message, but we still ought to be faithful to him in that. So he says, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? And it, again, he says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is, the message is heard through the word of Christ. It must be proclaimed. And so there's kind of three, um, I guess, little application points that, that I wanted to have is, one is I want to encourage y'all to, to be sent where you are, you know, to, to be sent to the people that are in your community. 
you know, that, that advanced community church would be a, a church that has a heart for the lost, that's broken for the lost, that would grow through its evangelistic efforts, that it would see churches planted in that area. Um, and that, that, you would, that you would be sent where you are. God has you where you are for a reason. So I want to encourage you, if you don't know Christ as, as your Savior, to talk to, to Pastor Scott or any of those leaders there and to ask them more about this, but um, to get right with him. And then for, for the members and, and everyone else to, to, to plug into your church and, and to, to be faithful, whether it's just going across the street or over the fence, wherever it may be, but to, to wrestle with the scriptures and to fight for this, this love for God and to share that with others. And it's going to be challenging and it's going to be difficult because, you know, like me, like sometimes I don't know what to say. Sometimes I'm scared. Um, but it's in that moment, in those places where we're right where God wants us to be, where we're depending on, upon him and saying, God, I'm scared. Give me strength. Like, God, I don't know what to say. Give me the words. God, give me an opportunity. And we can see his, his grace sustain us and his glory manifested through us as that message is proclaimed. So one was to be sent. And, and the second was um, cross the border. I mean, I know it's difficult right now with the pandemic, but, but some of you, uh, I think David Platt said this, need to tithe your time. You know, and, and take a one week trip, a one week mission trip, and and, and see um, Juan in, in the Dominican Republic, and, and come see uh, uh, me and, and Francisco in Guatemala, and or, or where, whoever wherever it may be, but cross the border and 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 be involved in church planning globally, it, be help those those churches uh, in, in their evangelism and their evangelism efforts, and in their discipleship efforts. There's countless stories of of mission trips of mission uh, teams that have come down. And someone has shared the gospel, and we see someone saved, and we can plug them up and plug them into our, our church. So some of you need to consider going on a mission trip. And then the last one is to be zealous senders. There's people that are going to go, um, but we need people to send us. You know, and so I want to encourage you to uh, be zealous senders um, uh, through your church. Uh, I know that, that Advanced Community Church is, is big into um, uh, church planning and, and big into giving, and, and I've been a recipient of that, and I've been so thankful for that. So I want to encourage you to, to be zealous senders, to keep giving to your local church uh, and, 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 and ask your local church, if, if, you know, hey, how can we continue to um, give to, to those overseas? So be zealous senders. Uh, I, I want to end with this um, quote. I believe it's by, by Piper. There are those who go... There are those who send, and there are those who disobey. And so um, I just want to encourage you to be either a goer or a sender, to be faithful in your church and, and be faithful in the Great Commission, to be faithful in, in church planning, and to have this desire for, uh, for God's glory to be spread across the world, this love for him and this brokenness for the loss locally and globally. I want to encourage you invite you into that. So let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for who you are. God, um, I thank you for Advanced Community Church, God, and um, just the work that you're doing there. And I pray that you'd raise people up within the local church to make your name known and, and be involved in, in church planning, whether that's locally or globally. And I pray all this in your name. Amen.